Matthew. Welcome. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. It is an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Here's the latest. Someday is today. So you've written a book. You're a creative guy. You're a productive guy, but you've written a book about productivity. Uh, but this is book number eight. No, 11. 11? No, published. eight. Eight. It is eight. eight. Okay. Yes. I okay. wish it was 11, but it is eight. Yeah. And this book starts off, this book, uh, Someday is Today. Let me give you the full, the full subtitle is 22 Simple, Actionable Ways to Propel Your Creative Life. And so, um, but you start off talking about hope. This is sort of the, one of the foundational concepts that once that, that you need to have that in order to do it. So talk about that. What is that? When you say that, we all know what that word means, but what does it mean to you in a more sort of lived way? I think the idea is that we really can't take even a step forward unless we have some belief within us that that step forward might yield a positive result, that tomorrow might be better than today. Not necessarily, because we're certainly going to have setbacks along the way. But, you know, I reached a point in my life where I was nearly hopeless. And I just remember how awful that was. Probably the worst sort of time of my life is that time when you just think, I'm never going to be more than this. And right. what this is, is terrible. And when that happens, it's really hard to get people to believe that start making small changes, start changing your mindset, start building up some strategies and structures around you to be more productive and creative. All of those things sort of fall apart if you can't believe that tomorrow yeah. might be better than today. But your parents made a very strange decision about you when you were in high school. So they were going to boot you out of the house, and they did when you, you're, you're senior. So this is, I, this is bad parenting 101, but didn't you have to go and find your own self-worth where sometimes when you have parents say, you're great, I'm sure you're like encouraging your kids all the time, right? And yeah. some, they're still going to have to find it, but like you had to either find it or die, really, right? Yeah, it was, um, it was life without a safety net. You yeah. know, I remember when I graduated no. from high school and I was out on my own, one of the conscious decisions I made, thank God, was I was never going to experiment with drugs because I understood that right. there's no safety net. And if something right. happens, I'm arrested, I get addicted, something trouble ensues from this particular problem that I see people having, no yeah. one is going to catch me. Yeah. And so, yeah, living without a safety net, I don't think it's wonderful and I don't recommend it. No, but I do believe, you know, it got me to where I am. But I do always remember what my therapist said, which is for every one of you that somehow managed oh, to climb your way up. There's there's thousand. dozens of them who yeah. did not and they're suffering because of it. So yeah. I always like to think that I had a really difficult period in my life that garnered me an enormous amount of wisdom. And my goal in life is to offer that wisdom to people without the pain <laughs> that came with it. You know, I really want that. I want to yeah. say, listen, I understand things about life that other people don't because of things I experienced and things I saw. Let me tell you and please believe me. Otherwise, you'll either never learn it or you'll have to learn it the hard way, which is right. the way I learned it. Right. And so I was, this was my next question, which is, so you write novels, but what, what, uh, talk about the decision to write something that's nonfiction. It's a very, I mean, it's such a different, I write nonfiction now. I wrote fiction for a while. I do creative nonfiction about writing and creativity. It's a very different approach, sort of. We, so talk about the decision to do that because it's a, almost a different voice too, I would imagine, or maybe yeah. it's a voice. Yeah, it's my voice, really. My yeah. fiction is, it's either written in the first person, which is then it's very much the voice of a protagonist, or it's right. written in the third person, which is still a modified version of, probably yeah. some sense yeah. of the book, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with my two books of nonfiction, it is very much my voice completely. It's why I narrate the audio versions of both. Right, right. But both books sort of were answers to questions, you know? The story worthy is a second. Yeah, yeah. So ah. story worthy is sort of, I can't spend a week with you at your storytelling workshop. Is there a way I can get that instruction without having to come to Connecticut and spend a week? Right. And I thought, I'll write that book. And it expanded beyond you know, what I would teach in a workshop, but that's essentially what it became. I see. And Some Days Today is the result of me standing in front of lots and lots of people through storytelling and writing books and giving speeches. And during that Q&A section of every one of those talks, people say, right. 
how do you manage to do everything you do? You're an elementary school teacher, you write books, you run businesses, you're a minister, you're a DJ, right. <laughs> like all of these things. Right. And I always wanted to say, like, if you'll give me 18 hours, I'll teach you how to structure your life and adjust your philosophy and give you some right. strategies. But no one wants to spend 18 hours with me, including my own family, <laughs> maybe just my cats. <laughs> and so the book is the answer to that question. It is rather than let me throwing out three strategies and hoping that for the best, read the book, it really will help you sort of get on a path that'll allow you to realize your dreams. So it's fun. It, the stuff I write is similar in that it's based on workshops I took. I was teaching the workshop, like, well, I would like a book. But for me, even that, when I wrote the first of those kinds of books, I, I said, I started writing and I was like, this is boring. I need to discover something or I can't write it, even though I've taught this. And so I did. I, and this is the same thing I'm, the thing I'm writing now. So did you discover stuff? Because you've obviously been teaching this and teaching it, but you must have thought about stuff that you hadn't thought about. You hadn't tried to teach anybody and you had to sit down and think through. Did you discover something in writing it for yourself? Yeah. And you know what happens for me is in both of the books, really, I engage in processes that are somewhat inherent and automatic to me because of lived experience and time and things like that. And so then when someone says, teach me how to tell a story, you know, my first thought is, well, I don't know, just tell the story. And then I right. hear their version of the story and I go, oh, well, you're making this mistake, this mistake, right. this mistake. Right. And suddenly through the deconstruction of the process, my own process, I came up with what essentially is a curriculum for telling a story. Right. And the same thing happened with some days today. How do you manage to get everything done that you get done? I started going, well, let me look at my life. And in right. doing that, I just deconstructed my days and said, right. here's what I do in terms of preserving my spirit and saving time and making good choices and surrounding myself with the right people and eliminating the wrong people. And, and I even interviewed people, you know, I would talk to my wife and I'd say, well, what do I do? And she's right. like, you're a crazy person. Here's one of the things that you do. She's like, it's, right. it works, but you're crazy. <laughs> you know, and I would ask my friends and, you know, through that process, I sort of discovered what I did that I didn't have a conscious awareness of. Yeah. And have you gotten more productive as you've gotten older? Do you find yourself just getting better and better at it? I have gotten better mostly because as the years have gone by, I've just started to understand with clear sense, with a clear sense, what is important and what is not. And so I have just managed to eliminate enormous amounts of you know, debilitating activities that are not required in my life. Right. So anytime I can wipe something away and just never do it again, I am a big fan of that. And I think every year I sort of find a new thing that I don't have to do anymore. What's important? When you say what's, what is important to Matthew Dix? What is well, important to you? Uh, you know, ultimately... It can't, it can't be being productive. I mean, nothing wrong with being productive. Right. I am productive too. People, oh, you mm -hmm. do this. but that actually, to me, isn't what's important, even though it's a pro that I do produce stuff. Does that make sense? So what's, yeah. maybe that is important to you. I don't know. What is no, I, I think you're right. I, you know, ultimately I live my entire life with the desire of not feeling regret at the end of my life, you know, and right. that comes right. from the idea that, you know, I have books and stories I want to tell, and I have children I want to spend time with. You know, a good example of it is, I know that Johnny Depp recently had a problem with his girlfriend or his yeah. ex-wife, someone like that. Yeah, I think it was ex-wife, I think so. Okay, I don't know what happened, really. All I knew I was know. that everyone in my life was talking about this. Right. And I decided I wasn't going to get involved. I thought they don't need me in their life to begin with. But right. more importantly, you know, I talk in the book about deliberate and curiosity, like to to culture yourself so that don't be curious about things that are going to waste your time. And yeah. I remember there was a day when everyone was talking about Johnny Depp and I decided to go pet my cat. I, literally what I did was I pet my cat while they were talking about Johnny Depp. Right. And now every time I see Johnny Depp, his name or a movie, I think about my cat. And uh, how I pet my cat. That's now that's great because my cat is only going to live 12 to 18 years. These right. poor things, they die too quickly on me. Yeah. There'll be a day when Toby, one of my cats is gone. But every time I see Johnny Depp, I'll think to myself, I spent time with my cat instead of being focused on things that don't help me in any way. And that's sort of that absence of regret. 
I am not going to regret the way I spent my time. I'm going to spend it well, and I'm going to spend it by making things or being with the people or the animals that I care about most. That is sort of what I'm seeking to do. Matt, this has been a lot of fun. I'm almost done with you. Not quite done with you, though. I have one more question. <laughs> okay. One more question. What I want you to do is finish this sentence. All right. Writing, just writing. All the writing you've done in your life has taught you anything. It's taught you what? If all, all the writing in my life has taught me that the more I write, the more often I write, um, you know, the more frequently I engage in the process, the better the writer I become. Truly every day, it's like, it's like chopping wood. It's you write good sentences. And if you learn how to write good sentences, you can become a good writer. So it's not a talent. It's not given on high. It is truly a craft that can be learned over time.